Okay, I make that. I make that nine o'clock in the UK, so one p.m. in San Francisco. So I think we're we're ready to go with our latest uh, online NFJ meetup. So welcome, um, if you. And uh, today we're going to be uh, we're joined by Fernando, uh, who's going to be talking to us about uh, learning uh, Chinese with NFJ. So uh, hi, Fernando. I guess I'll let you uh, introduce yourself and. Hi, Mark. So thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to talk today with you in the online meetup. So yes, my, my name is Fernando. I work for um, a biotech company called Oxford Nanopore Technologies. But uh, today I want to talk about something very different, which is basically how I have been using Neo4j and the concept of graph databases for helping me keep track of some of the words that I am learning while learning Chinese. Yeah, so I guess I guess probably the first uh, uh, question would be: uh, Is this the first thing you've used Neo4j for, or how did you how did you come across it in the first place? Well, it, it's something that I have been keeping an eye for for quite a while. Initially, and uh, the first use cases that I started to play a little bit with it was more related to my PhD research. So I was uh, working on phylogenetic trees and. In general, in bioinformatics, in the analysis of biological data, trees and networks are data structures that come up all the time because genes are connected in many different ways with each other, with proteins. Trees are related, are very often used to model evolutionary relationships and so. And um, Neo4j was always like a very good way of modeling this, this type of things. And then when, when I started to, to use it, I realized that it also would be very useful for linguistic approaches. So I had been playing around with other types of databases, relational databases when, when learning um, German. So I had set up like a small app for learning vocabulary. And when I started to learn Chinese, I thought that if I wanted to do something similar, um, that would be a very good use case for, for Neo4j. Cool. And so, what was so, so you've done relational database stuff before? How did you find? Did you find that you were able to use some of that knowledge, or was it completely different? Or what was your experience between uh, comparing those two? I suppose those two different models of database. Uh, yeah, well, it, it's quite different. I mean, like uh, for me, like uh, what I found very different was like the freedom that you have to change your model, as in the sense that when working with relational databases, I always found that it was very, very important to get the right schema up front right before you would start to develop your application. Whereas with Neo4j, what I have found is that it is very easy once that you have an existing model to keep um, adding additional features. And especially if you are modeling something that has a lot of exceptions or a lot of things that don't really follow very strict rules, um, it seemed to be like it was like a much more flexible way of modeling that. I, I think we, we, we will see some examples of that later when, when we go through the slides. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't want to cover all the material. So. <laughs> So you mentioned you've done, so you've done have, you, have you built a, a German vocabulary graph, did you say? So this is your, is this your second, uh, second language graph? No, no, no. For, for the German language, I, I was not using graph databases. I, I did that much, much longer ago. I was just making like a, a little application to practice how to guess the right article in German language, because in German you have like three articles for each word, and they don't really follow any kind of rule. So okay. I had like a small app where you where you would have like a database with the articles and the and the words and you would have to guess them. But that was very very relational. It was basically just like a bunch of tables, really. Cool. And so Chinese in particular, I think you mentioned when we were talking that you'd uh, you'd lived in China before, and that's why you'd got interested in this. You maybe tell us tell tell everyone a bit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it was for a very short time when my wife was working there, so I was on a sabbatical for for three months. I had a lot of free time, and then I I started to to learn Chinese. Uh, seriously on on that time and then when i when i came back to the uk i really wanted to uh, continue doing something to keep track of the vocabulary i had learned and to you know to have something to kind of monitor over time uh, what are the words that i have learned so far and what are the next words that i would like to learn and that's that's a little bit how i came up with the idea of 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 this application of this graph really like to model uh, chinese vocabulary cool all right i think that's a pretty good introduction so hopefully everyone's uh... Everyone understand. It's a good, good intro for you, for everyone. So I think now we'll switch over and we'll do. So Fernando's going to do a presentation. So I'll just give you the power to present. Okay. So let me see. I'm going to share my screen now. So. Cool. Yeah. So just for anyone who's uh, everybody watching, sometimes uh, people can't see. Uh, so Fernando's going to show some slides and some. 
some stuff in the near 4 j browser. If the text is a bit grainy or not really zoomed in for you, try, uh, if you go on the bottom right-hand side of the, your YouTube video, there's a set your resolution to 720p, and it will be much clearer. Uh, right, OK, anyway, I'll, I'll, over to you, for, uh, Fernando. OK, yeah, thanks. OK, yeah, so um, thanks for the introduction, Mark. So well, I mean, I'm not really like an expert in Neo4j. I'm neither an expert with the Chinese language, so it's like very amateur. Um, what I'm going to show today is a little bit like this little side project that I have been working on where I am, well, just yes, using Neo4j to, to model um, learning Chinese vocabulary. So I will also show some screenshots on how I am then using this graph to build an application that helps me uh, to, to remember or to, to follow some recommendations to learn some words. So for those of you that are not familiar with the Chinese language, I think a good starting point to, to understand um, how Chinese language works is to look at at the written language and to think of the concept of segmentation. So here, if we take like um, an English word, this is the best meeting in London, and then we look at the translation in Chinese, the first thing that uh, comes to, to our mind is that the concept of word is a bit difficult to grasp because we, we basically see like a sequence of characters. And here we have the pronunciation, and this has already been segmented. So we can use the white spaces to understand what are like the different pronunciation units that correspond to words. But it's not really easy uh, programmatically, so to speak, without having an understanding of the, of the language to, to delimit what are different words as in the sense of semantic units. So that's something that is kind of very intuitive, obviously, for, for Chinese speakers. Uh, but for those of us that are learning the language from scratch, um, you, you really need to have a lot of context to, to wrap your mind around this concept. And the one way that I find um, easy to, to think about this is to think of the sentences as something that you can decompose. So the, the highest level would be like the sentence, and then you can decompose a sentence into words, as in the sense of se uh, semantic units. So here, for example, we would have um, how true, which means tasty, and this can be decomposed into different characters. This one means good, and this one means it. So they lo logically can be combined into something like tasty. But then it's not only that we use different characters to come to uh, to be combined into words. It's also that the characters themselves can be um, separated into other written units that, when seen in isolation, have, have some meaning on itself. So, for example, in this case, the character for woman and the character for child, when they are put together, they form another character, but it has like a very different pronunciation. So, as you see here, the combination of these two um, is a new character and has a new pronunciation, but here when we combine two characters and we combine the pronunciation, what we are building is actually a word. So we combine both the pronunciation, the characters, and the semantics and build a new word. And then you can also take characters and further decompose them into uh, single strokes. So as you see, like we have like different layers in this kind of hierarchy. Um, so. When when you start as a, as a as a beginner, one of the things that is quite scary is that you don't really have an alphabet to work with, which is the typical thing that you learn first when approaching a new language. So what you have to do is you, you need to learn a lot of different written characters. And uh, well, like in, in Chinese, like I guess nobody really knows how many characters there are, but native speakers can read uh, thousands of them. Um, and probably write uh, also thousands, or so probably read tens of thousands and write thousands of characters. As a beginner, one thing that helps a lot is to use the so-called HSK lists. These are like um, organized lists that are ranked by uh, six different levels. Um, and the sum of all of them um, constitute uh, 5,000 different words. So in order to construct these words, you need to uh, learn 2,500 characters, and these characters use uh, around 250 radicals, which are like um, key components that are reused very often. Um, and then the radicals and the characters are all composed of, uh, of strokes. So in the end, you have like a finite number of strokes, which by combining with each other can, can build different characters. And this is basically a, a good target goal, because when you uh, are familiar with this number of characters and words, this will give you enough knowledge to probably read a newspaper and have some basic communication skills. 
Now, having said that, to learn 2,000 characters from scratch is very difficult, especially if you don't really have any context or anything. So something that helps a lot is you know, to gradually have some kind of plan on uh, strategically deciding what are the characters that you are going to learn first and, and why. Um, so I guess like the reason why I decided to use Neo4j as a backend for, for, for this project was that I saw a lot of um, tree-like and network-like structures in, in this use case. So as I sh showed before, the words and the characters can be decomposed in, in some kinds of hierarchies, but then the words are, are also very connected with each other in the sense that it is very common in the Chinese language that you combine existing words to have compound words with compound meaning, but then also the pronunciation uh, plays a, a very important role and the different strokes are very often reused in, in high frequency. So there are like a lot of non-obvious connections that when you start to study the language we become more apparent. And also there is not like a very clear model on how you want to uh, go from from the way you pronounce something to the way you write it. So Chinese language has a lot of homophones. It, it doesn't have a lot of different syllables. So it's it's really difficult. Like you cannot really rely on the pronunciation to remember how to write a word. You really need to be able to map um, these things uh, in in a, in a in a very particular way. So here's just like an example so that you get an idea of of, of these things that I'm talking about. So in general, you can take like for example, these four words, what they have in common is that they all share this character, and then these three pronunciations, they all follow the same intonation. And this is a little bit like the idea on, on how things start to look like a network when you when you display them. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about uh, the, the graph model. This is a simplified version of, of the model, but I think it, it's, a, it's a good starting point. So I guess, the interesting thing here is that the central bit of the model are the words. So the, the raw data, so to speak, are these lists of words that I was mentioning. And then uh, the words can be decomposed into multiple characters, and the characters can have radicals that can be written, written in different way. And then uh, we also keep track of the intonation. So I have separated all this because all these nodes that we see on these labels, this is basically like the published uh, data. And then what we see here in this bit, this would be like uh, the people. So this would be like users of the application. So people interact only with words, right? So what we do is like different users can uh, have a different state for different words. So one user may be at the stage of learning this word and another one may already know this word or have some other type of relationship. So this would be like user data um, uh, that we keep adding to the graph. This would be the data that we import in the beginning. And the remainder of the graph is what I call here like the backbone nodes, which is kind of a, an annotation on the, on the existing graph. And basically what, what I use this type of nodes for is to describe um, in which order um, I want to learn some, some of the concepts here. So typically it will be like uh, all these backbone nodes have a next relationship so that you can have one backbone node that is related to some of the uh, words and characters that we are learning. And then we have like some indication of in which order we want to, to keep learning this. So the interesting bit here is that um, the learning order or the strategy is something that we can change at any point of time. Uh, and, and that's what I was mentioning before when, when, when I said that with the graph model, this is really something very, very flexible because you don't really need to have whatever you change in this area is not going to change the, the facts, which is like the initial data that you import from the published list. And the same you can say about the about the, the user data, right? So users can be interacting with words, so to speak, and in the sense that they learn, but they might also be, for example, grouping words by some topic and then have uh, users that follow a particular topic. So you can see how it's very easy to take this model and keep adding functionality without changing the underlying um, uh, lists of words. And here's a little bit one, one example of what I was saying before. So we have one word. The users only see the words because this is what they are interested in learning. But these words are related to the characters. And then we can use the learning strategy to present these words in a particular order. OK, so I'm going to show a few initial examples on what is the content of the of the graph. So the 
initial point basically is that after all what we have is lists of words that have been decomposed into characters so here we have one query where we take uh, the word uh, and then we can take this word and um, get all the characters related to this word so here we have we have three and then we take another word and uh, take all the characters and we present them together in the query so we have one word with three characters and we get another word with one character that's what we expected so one of the first uh, questions that we may ask is like what is the distribution of the length of the word how how often do we have uh, long words or short words um, and that's something that we can quickly query with something like this so we can say okay let's match all the words we have and return the length of the word as, as in the number of characters that would be our word length and then we get the counts and what we get is that we only have words of up to four characters the most common ones uh, are by far two character words followed by one character word and then the the, the rest are, are not very common so before well, i'll just i'll just pause you for a little yeah. okay so a couple of questions so for the model, uh, how did you how did you come up with it? Did you was that like the first attempt, or what was your process for, for um, designing this? Yeah, so this this was kind of an iterative process, I would say, because in the beginning I had a very simple model where basically there were only words and users and a backbone. Um, but then at some point I realized that it was difficult to um, attach. Uh, a specific meaning uh, only to, to to a character or to a word because often like one character may uh, have like multiple meanings and then at some point I realized that actually even though we have many uh, words that are composed of one character modeling them separately had a lot of advantages because you could completely separate um, the written form which is the character from the word which is the semantic unit and is what users are actually interested in learning so I guess it was kind of a process of a starting with something very simple with very few labels and then as I was designing the queries I realized that they were not returning what I wanted and it was then quite quite easy to just iterate and change the importing scripts into a more complex model that would uh, be more useful for answering the questions that I wanted to ask and in the end also like another, another thing that I realized is that um, in the beginning I had a, like a lot of scripting code for post-processing the, the, the queries, but the, the more that I was thinking about the model, the more that I could get done straight from Cypher, from the query language. And in the end on the application, there is almost like no scripting code. It's almost only like, just like running the query to the model and getting immediately the answer that I want to represent in HTML in the website. So that, that's something that I, I found very amazing actually, to which extent you can push all the information into the model in a way that you just get the query and that does not really require any post-processing. Cool. And then we've got a question from the YouTube chat from Adam Cowley, which is, how much knowledge of Chinese did you have when you started building out your model? Um, well, that was when I came back from China. So I was already familiar enough with the language to be able to uh, understand kind of how it worked in the sense of how the characters are used. So I could read like very basic texts, like maybe it would be like, the type of knowledge that you have when you are learning a language in high school for a couple of years, because yeah, something like that. So basically being able to read text, but at a very basic level, graded level, like with very low usage of words, maybe something like 400 words, something like that. So not, not very much. I, I still don't know much Chinese anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? Like once that you that you understand the, the model, then then the, the rest. That, that's why I'm using this actually to, to improve my vocabulary. Cool. Okay, and then the next couple of slides we started to look at Cipher. What was your approach for yeah. learning that? Like, how did you how did you go about picking up that language? Did you have any? I guess you had experience of SQL already. Yes, yes, I did. Yes, but I found Cipher like very, very different. Um, I think it's it's been such a gradual process that I don't really have any memory of learning Cipher. I think it was more like starting with the Neo4j tutorial. I remember finding that very, very easy to follow. Uh, which I know took like one hour or something with this movie. I think, yes, it's like a movie, uh, a movie graph database. Uh, and then from there, just basically by, by use case. So as I was developing the application and needed things, just like looking up and, and trying out things. But uh, it's, I found it very intuitive. So yeah, just looking up examples and trying to reuse things. I'm, I'm still learning Cypher. I, 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 I think, uh, Although I have read 
some of uh, quite a lot of documentation now I think I still struggle with the more complex queries yeah. Oh, cool, yeah, okay. I guess we can, 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 can carry on again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so I think this is where we were. So, so another question that I was wondering in the beginning is like, right, so since you have to learn so many characters, you need to start with some, so maybe you want to start with the most common ones. Uh, so what I was doing is like to use queries like this one. So with something like this, we can take all the words and take all the characters. And then we return all the characters, but they, we group them by characters that uh, uh, words that contain that character, and then we have the counts, right? And and this way we can see like this is the most common character in this data set. It comes up in sixty three different words, but this was including like the five thousand words. And then I wondered like what happens if we focus only on learning first the characters that are important for beginners, and then. I modify the query this way so that we take the whole set, but then we filter by the level one. So this is going to give us only 150 characters. And then the characters that are common in this subset are not necessarily the same, but actually this makes a lot of sense because if you look, now we are returning the translations as well. All these words are like very, very common words, right? Like today, table, so on. It's the kind of things that you want to learn in the very, very beginning. Um, and so then, you yeah. That's what I was going to say. So, do you have a you, you have a label on this? Is it HSK one is level exactly. one? Exactly. Like HSK yeah. two for level two and so on. That's correct. Yeah, that's correct. So those are six labels. Yeah, yeah. I think in the current model they are also properties because I ended up using this so much that I realized that it was also useful to have it as a property. But yeah, it is right. a label. Yeah, yeah, cool. yeah. And this this one, for example, is an interesting example. So if you look at the translation, a phone call, a movie, film, television, so all these are electric things. And then if you look at this character, this is the character for electricity. So you can see here like high frequency, simple characters that are like the, the, the type of things that you want to learn in the very beginning. OK, so when we look up existing characters, so we can do something like we take this one, this is like to be very common as well. So we can just take all the words that um, have one single character with a query like this, word has character written this way. And then we can also look up the, the pronunciation with it. Then we can get like a, a bunch of a bunch of words related to this character then we can also look up the words that only have this character so that would be like words with size one and then this is um what i was saying in the beginning right that although these two nodes seem to be the same they actually represent something different because here we have the one that has label word and we attach the pronunciation only to the word whereas the character is what we consider only the, the written form and although this may look like a unnecessary duplication there are other examples where this is very important like this this character for example we can rerun the same query and we get a bunch of words but when we look at the pronunciation here for example we have pne and here we have fang bien and i don't know if you can see it there but if this character is written in the same way it is the same character indeed it is this character but it has multiple pronunciations and different pronunciations have different meanings attached so that's why when we look at the character in isolation we get something like this so we get like two words that actually are the same character have different pronunciations and different attached meanings so this is something that I found that also helped me a lot to when modeling biological problems so often we have exceptions that are not very common but completely break your model and with the graph this is something that by adding one more label or something like that usually you can model these things in a very clean way so that you have the query and it will just return you whatever is the truth without wondering if this is very common or if it is an exception or not okay so so the the, the the main thing that I was after when designing this was the concept of, of a learning strategy or a recommendation system, if you will. And the idea here was that it would be good to have some kind of system that automatically tells you, given the things that you already know, what are the things that you want to know next, right? For, so for this, we need to annotate um, the status for, for, for each word. So the user is learning this word, is knows this word already or is struggling with this word and then we need to annotate uh, the material that we are learning in a way that we see this is more important has more weight and a particular order in which we want to learn something so the order itself could be something as simple as you know we want to learn first things that have 
that are important for ourselves for whatever reason because it's a topic we are interested in or because these words have like a high frequency use or it doesn't really matter it's just up, up to them um, the strategy to decide that and the way that this works is that we have the users um, you know learning ignoring or knowing some words and then the words always will have a character and the character is what is annotated by the by the backbone so here we have like a particular order and sometimes uh, in the backbone we will when we have these situations where one word has only one character then we can directly go from the backbone to the word so this is just we can get it from the query by looking at uh, ranges in the backbone so we are going to look at, uh, at this range and we can present all the words that are related to that. So here is a nice example, it's a little bit hand-picked, but this one is easy to visualize. So for example, if you look at this sequence of characters, they are all compositions. So here we have the character for head. And then if we combine this character with this bit, um, then we get the character for to buy. And then if we add at the top this other, um, this other structure, then we get the character for cell. And then if we add uh, this, this other stroke, then we get the character for uh, to read. So as we see, like it makes sense to learn things in this order because we are kind of adding complexity. And sometimes like in this case, these characters that come together have also some semantic relationship like to buy and to sell. Um, and that's like a reasonable way to set an order so that we can present these uh, characters in a way that rather than learning uh, in this order, we learn in this order so that we learn characters that are connected in a in a in a in a way that when we learn one, we already know something about the previous one. Okay, so how do we use this for recommendations? So I think maybe the best is to show some examples. So this would be like one query for a recommendation where we are trying to look at the set of words that we are learning and we want to make a ranking of what would be the top the top five that we are interested in so in this case what we do is we take a user in this case myself and we grab all the words that we are currently learning so then we take all these words we extract their characters and their pronunciation so that we can present them and then we take also the backbone nodes so what we can return there is the relationship in this case, well, it's trivial because we are already uh, filtering it there. Um, and then we extract also the, the level of its word. And we can use this to present the, the words in a particular order. So we can say we are going to show first the ones that are the easiest and the shortest and the ones coming up first in our learning strategy. And this way, out of all the words that we are currently learning, we can see on the top the low-hanging fruit, so to speak, right? So this would be words that have a um, beginner level and have a low number in our in our backbone. Um, okay, so when when once that I had like this graph model, I started to put together a prototype. So what I had is like a very thin API uh, written in Sinatra for the front end. Um, and I was using Neo4j, um, hosting it in Graphene for the for the back end and using the Neography uh, Ruby wrapper to communicate both. And this is kind of how it looks like. So this is like the concept of backbone. It's the same example we were seeing before the order. The colors don't, don't mean much here, but it's like a good way of studying the characters, listing the words, and then we can click in the word and look at the uh, details uh, relating the pronunciation, links to usage, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, something that, something that I wanted to mention as well is uh, what I said before about the model. So once that one thing that surprised me a lot while working on this project is that once that you get the model right, um, a lot of the processing work is doing in the query step itself. So for example, this was like the, the, the query I was showing before, the top five learning words. And I realized that when I'm building my application, this is how it looks like. So I get here like the top five words. This is something where basically there is like no processing in between. It's just like executing the query and moving it directly to this HTML table. Um, so that's something that before I, re I, I was like trying to sort these concepts and do the recommendation strategy in Ruby, then I realized that actually with the right type of model, we could do that directly in Cypher. So all these things we see here, they are just results of Cypher queries. So this is like looking at uh, for different levels, the counts of how many words we are like learning or already know for each different level. And these are two types of different recommendations. 
OK, um, I'm not sure how, how much time we have, but if I, if I have a little bit more of time, maybe I will just mention this one, uh, like the last. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's still good. Is it, is it good? OK. So this is, this is like uh, something that I, I, I think is not implemented in the application yet, but it's something that I found very interesting, which is like um, another thing that, that graphs are extremely good at is in telling you things that you don't know. Um, so for example, something that I wanted to do with this query is to think of, OK, so we have like this 5,000 words, and I know that I know uh, some, some words, and these words contain characters. So then I want to find out what are the words that contain characters that I already know, but for which I do not know the word yet. So this would be kind of like the unknown knowns, so words that you don't know yet, but that should be very easy to learn for you because you are already familiar with all the characters that compose that word. And I, this is something that I, I found this a little bit difficult to do it with Cypher. It took me quite a while, so I'm not sure if I will be able to explain it correctly again. So, But basically, I, I, I realized by looking at the graph that this is something that I should be able to solve with a query. And the way that this works is something like I basically uh, first select all the words that I don't know yet. So this would be like all these nodes, the ignored words. And then we find out what are the characters that are present in, in those words. And then we take another set, which would be the set of words that we already know and the characters that are related with that. So then we can take uh, this set of uh, ignored words and take like all the characters that compose that or a set of all those characters. Um, and then we do the same here with the, the words that we already know. So those are the characters that we already know. So now we have a set of characters that we know and a set of characters that belong to words that we don't know. I'm, I'm not sure if this is very, <laughs> if I'm explaining myself very well. But well, like I guess the, the, the short story is that then we can filter and extract only the characters that are present in the, the, the set that we want to learn and also in, in the set that we already know. So with this, what we can return is uh, this set of, of words. So this would be the words that we already know. And this would be words that we don't know yet, but that are composed only of characters that are present in this other set. And indeed, these are like very easy words. We can then rank them by level. So we can kind of select uh, words that the, the graph can effectively tell us these are words that should be very easy for you to learn. So it can be like a good principle for, for a recommendation. I'm not sure if that was very clear, but um, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting thing. OK, so maybe I'm going to say a little bit about what are the next things that I wanted to do with this project. So one, one aspect would be like to incorporate some grammar, some grammatical concept. But more interestingly is to um, although I have been talking at the level of, of, of words, I think when learning a language, it's very important that you work with uh, context so that you are studying tests that is relevant or important for you. So if we keep adding to this graph blocks of text that represent stories or songs or subtitles from movies, then we can use this type of recommendation to, for example, recommend to you songs that would be easy for you to understand. And then you can focus on, on learning that type of text or the same thing for movies, sections of movies or things like that, or, or especially with storytelling, that's something that can, can work very well. So one thing that I would like to incorporate is to some NLP so that we can do like complete uh, content recommendation that would be like taking lists of stories and then using NLP to um, extract maybe keywords or something like that, and then map that to the words that we already know so that we can make a, a much richer recommendation experience. Um, and also regarding like the technology itself, so I've been working with, uh, with Ruby for the web app client, but maybe at some point it would be nice to, to have like some mobile clients for, for this kind of thing. Um, and also like separate a bit more like the, the web application from the database itself. Like something that I've been looking into lately is uh, Docker. So working with uh, a Dockerized container for the Neo4j application and another container for the for the Sinatra uh, API. And that, that really seems to work very well and seems to be like a very nice way of isolating the, the two um, environments. OK, so I think this might be a Good point to stop since most of these things we have already discussed, uh, Mark. So if you want to 
take over. Yeah, cool. So uh, Tim, Tim says that the explanation was good and, and likes your <laughs> idea of uh, suggesting to learn words that are not known but comprise known characters on the on the uh, two couple of slides ago. Yeah. So does anybody, if you have any questions uh, for Fernando, put them in the in the chat and we can uh, we can go over them. Uh, otherwise, while we're while we're waiting for that, uh, there was there's someone else who uh, who we spotted through the this week in Near for J newsletter that some of you may have seen called uh, Diego Fernandez. He couldn't he couldn't make it to, to join us on the meetup today, but he's been working on uh, something in, in a very similar area, also learning uh, Chinese using uh, using Near for J and has has built. Uh, it's got it on a GitHub repository, so I'm just going to show you. I'm just going to switch to me. Okay, should I stop sharing now, Mark? Uh, yeah, yeah. See, so I've already, I've already stopped uh, okay. from sharing. So if I change over to me now, hopefully uh, you can see my screen. And so this is Diego's uh, repository. So I'll paste that link into the chat uh, in in a minute. Uh, so it's Diego Emeralds and then Chinese underscore EXP. And so Diego was doing very similar things. So you can see some of the, the, the language used is the same as, as what Fernando has mentioned. So we've got, uh, in this case, Chinese uh, radicals. And, and Diego's then put it together into a, an IPython notebook. So you can, um, and this time using, so using a, uh, the Python driver rather than the, the Ruby neography driver. And this is actually using the, the Bolt uh, protocol, which was introduced in Neo for J3.0. And I think, uh, Fernando, uh, I forget where did you get the data for your? Yeah, so I was using I was using like the, uh, some um, published uh, lists. So these are basically CSV files that contain the words and the English translation as well as the pronunciation. But then um, in the in the beginning, I was just um, importing the CSV files. But then what I started to do is to do a lot of pre-processing as I was changing the model. Um, I had to do some pre-processing so that I would not import directly the words, but more like um, the, the relationships in a way that it would make sense according to my model. So now I'm not using, I'm not importing from CSV directly. I'm more like relying on some Ruby, Ruby code that does the pre-processing and connects to the database and starts to insert the nodes with, with neography. But I think I think what I may do is to separate that pre-processing, rewrite the CSV files into something that complies with the model, and then use some some more efficient importing with load CSV or or something like that. Maybe yeah. Cool. I think Diego had found a, had found a I don't know if he found exactly the same data set, but a similar data set. Mm. Uh, but then uh, in this example that I'm just scrolling through now, kind of combines uh, near for j queries and puts the output into uh, pandas. So PD is a pandas data frame. So this is a a way of uh, taking like a query results and putting it into tabular form, and so you could, there's lots of different queries that you can run from pandas. Uh, so, for example, here it's, we're looking at the, the popularity of radicals based on the, the number of characters with, the, with certain radicals in. Exactly. And then, yeah. So th this this one's quite a good one. So this, this has got all the all the code yeah. for for reproducing as well. Uh, yeah. And then and the models. How similar is that model to your one? After you probably have a better memory than me. Uh, yeah, so this yeah this this model is a little bit different because it seems to be more focused um, directly on on the words themselves. So I I don't think it's uh, actually doing the same thing because this seems like more to be considering words and characters as the same thing. Yeah, but yeah it's it's kind of similar in the sense that it can be used to you take like one single character or word and you map it to multiple meanings and and that can help you to to keep track of these. Yeah. Yeah, so two, two, I suppose two slightly different approaches to mm -hmm. uh, to the same goal. Uh, so I'll put the link for this into the into the chat, but I'm probably done. I'm probably done with presenting that for now. So if you you can probably take a look at that if you if you want to for more. Right. So that's both of us stopped presenting. Hopefully, so I'll just check if there's any any more questions for us. It doesn't look like there are. If anybody's got got any final questions. Shout now or or forever hold your peace, I suppose. Okay. So there we go. So I guess is, I'm not seeing any other any other questions uh, on there. So yeah, I guess we'll, we'll thanks to, to to Fernando for for joining us. Then uh, you get get a, get a video of me get a video of me again. Fernando still got his <laughs> still, still still got your picture. I think we got a request for uh, for your video, but uh, we'll let you off this time. 
Okay. Uh, if you're if you if you've been following the meetups, we've got another one next week uh, at a bit of an earlier time. So I'll just paste the, the link for that in there. So this one is with uh, Amanda Schaefer, who's going to be showing us how we can plan hikes uh, and and using content-based filtering to come up with similar hikes that, that we might be interested in. So that will be at four o'clock. Yeah, four o'clock UK next Thursday, or that's eight a.m. San Francisco. Uh, Oh, yeah, I see there was a question about what is NLP. So it's, it's already been answered in the chat. So NLP, natural language processing. And uh, NLTK is a Python package that, that uh, people tend to use uh, to do that stuff. Um, we've got, I've actually found a project where someone's uh, someone's been doing some NLTK on the Bible. Uh, so okay. that'll, be, that'll be featuring in our, uh, our newsletter this week. Um, cool. So uh, thanks to Fernando for taking the time to come and present to us. And thank you to everybody uh, for taking the time out to to join, and we'll see you next time. So, thanks, Fernando. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Bye. See you. Ciao.